Hello, I'm Chris Howden. Welcome to And the Winner Is, CBC's audio trophy case of award-winning radio. And the winner is... 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 Without question, Lhasa de Sela had a unique childhood. She lived on a bus, exploring the United States and Mexico with her mother and father, her three sisters, two cats, and three birds. Eventually, she settled in Montreal's Mile End. She surrounded herself with fellow artists and musicians. She was never concerned with the vagaries of the music market, but that didn't stop her three albums from being huge successes. She moved between Spanish, French, and English as fluidly as she moved between time zones and landscapes. When Lhasa died on New Year's Day 2010, it came as a shock. In Montreal, it was as if the world had ground to a halt. Her website reported that it snowed for more than 40 hours after her departure. A number of months after Lhasa died, writer and broadcaster Madonna Hamel rediscovered a conversation she had recorded with Lhasa a few years earlier. She decided to go to Montreal and share that recording with some of Lhasa's fellow artists and friends. The result is a documentary featuring a mix of voices and song, including parts of her original conversation with Lhasa. Most of the conversations took place at a small cafe a few doors from Lhasa's home. Here is She Moves Between Worlds. There are always people who need to be yelled at and people who are longing to be whispered at. There seems to be a certain kind of faith in the audience to be able to do that. It's true. And there's a song that I do on the show that's uh, just piano and voice. It's a very, very gentle song. We call it the lullaby. And sometimes I feel like I'm I'm imposing gentleness on people. Mm. (laughs) Like I'm deciding for everybody this is going to be a couple of minutes of extreme gentleness because we all need it really badly. Her gentleness and at least her thrive to gentleness was very solid. I remember I was on tour with her just for fun and we were in Berlin and (laughs) we passed in front of a shop that was selling um, those tricks, you know, uh, like glasses that you can see backwards with and uh, lighters that if you light them you get an electric shock and I bought the lighter. And I was having so much fun, like giving it to people, and they would get the electric shock. And and there was this man coming who asked for a light, and we were all sitting on a bench. And so I ran to him, and I gave him the lighter, and she got so upset. And she was the only one who just stood up and said, no, no, you can't do that, you know. And it was really a joke and a stupid thing, but she had a lot of trouble being unkind. You know, growing up on the, on the road in a bus and living in, in people's driveways and we lived on a Catholic commune, a Catholic communist commune in upstate New York. It was a pretty amazing place, actually. It's like I wasn't just reading about adventures and, and magic. I was also living it. I mean, we'd be, we would live in places where there was no electricity, which is really amazing because then you look up in the sky at night and you see the Milky Way. And, and just living with that presence changes a lot of things. Your, your life is much more magical. And animals and the ocean and, you know, like almost drowning in the ocean and stepping on a sea urchin and you know, all of these kind of strange intense experiences are like living in trailer parks where there were really strange really strange people and living kind of out on the edge i always had this image of um the way things were i mean a hundred years ago or 200 years ago where if you were a sailor you would get on a boat and you'd sail away and you didn't really know if you were ever going to come back. Con toda palabra, con toda sonrisa, con toda mirada, con toda 
caricia me acerco al agua bebiendo tu beso la luz de tu cara la luz de tu cuerpo es ruego el quererte es canto de mundo mirada de ciego secreto desnudo me entrego a tus brazos con miedo y con calma un ruego en la boca Whatever we did, she wanted to enjoy the process. That's what she wanted. Ralph Tfuni. I met her when she was looking for a director to do her music video. She thrived on symbols and, and, and magical stuff and fairy tales. She loved the fact that big change can happen, massive change, in the smoothest, simplest way without drama. Uh, I will show you a little card she gave me. It's like this cartoon little bunny doing a painting and it says art is simple. You think Lhasa. No, no. <laughs> it's a bunny saying art is simple. That's Lhasa. Of course, this is the summum. Art is simple. La luz de tu cuerpo La luz de tu cara La luz de tu My name is Sarah Page and I'm a harpist. The two of us met at a time where she was starting to look around in this neighborhood and thinking to herself, she knows so many great musicians, why can't we just get together and play music together and see if it feels right? And the two of us were spending so much time together anyways, we were neighbors and best friends and so I would go over there all the time and the, the first time I brought the harp over there actually that was the day we wrote Fool's Gold together. We just sat down and she told me like, oh I have this melody and I keep thinking maybe I want to do something with it and I just wrote a little chord progression and we just recorded a little demo of it that night. I don't miss you much except sometimes I Lhasa, the point of singing was not to be in front of an audience and have a career and be a singer. Singing and creativity in general, she believed more strongly than anything else that creativity was the key to everything in the world and it was the current of life was in creativity and it was like the ultimate goal for her. My name is Miles Perkin and I, I play the, the contrabass, the double bass. We're in the Mile End. Lassa just lived right around the corner from here. Her house is maybe five houses away from where we are now. I used to live just at the other end of this street. I think the first time we spoke was just 
at the side of a stage after a concert that neither of us were involved in. She explained how much she just loved the sound of the bass. Like she really had like a passion for that, just kind of that boost of air that it gives. I got caught in the storm. That sense of like rising and then slamming back down to the ground, almost like the the sledgehammer striking something down that pushes the ball up to hit the bell or something, where it's like the downward force that gives the lift. It always felt like that was happening on stage all the time. I was rising up, hitting the ground and breaking. It's interesting thinking back of intensity and in performance and the way she used to perform versus now. I think she was rediscovering that intensity but she really, especially in the last couple of years and on this album, she stopped wanting to force. I mean, it started with having trouble with her voice and having to relearn how to sing, basically, because she was straining her voice too much. She did a lot of emotional work on herself, just figuring out where that strain is coming from, why it's there, what it's hiding, that forcing, and what's underneath it always stripping away layers of between herself and her art and the world. She was just intense because she was she was so incredibly connected and solid. She could just breathe and allow everything to open up without having to force it through anymore. It's true. When I started out, just to get my kind of my courage up to be on stage, I needed an incredible amount of intensity and emotion kind of filled up the space, the, the scary space, you know. And I discovered over the years that people were listening and that I, could, I didn't have to yell. And the great pleasure of, um, of kind of pulling back and letting people come towards you is really a wonderful feeling. And when it happens during a show, then you feel like something's really happening. Because if you think it's all supposed to come from you and that people are just passive you know, screens or containers for what you're pouring onto them, it can get exhausting and boring. Mm -hmm. the, what's interesting is the meeting. I don't know how often I've gone to see a show where there is so much silence in, in a song that there's something so incredible about using waiting. And especially performing in that way, all of a sudden you're so much more connected to and reliant upon your audience they're going to affect what you're what you're doing so much more greatly when when you decide to just wait in the middle of a song and just stop the song and not move and nobody moves and if your audience is really with you all of a sudden everybody is allowed to just sit there expectantly together and have this experience she, she always dreamed of singing this way, and she said towards the end, the last performances we gave, she was starting to feel that it was actually happening, like she was singing and we were just this organism, like we were all part of the same body. She always said that we're all singing, I'm just the one with the mouth. <laughs> As soon as I get on stage, it's, the songs have to happen. They have to happen and the songs have to be strong enough and deep enough so that they can renew themselves all the time. I couldn't hear what you were saying. She was very careful to make sure that the songs always stayed really alive and would actually kind of have more vitality the more we played them as opposed to less you know so it, instead of getting tired of the songs it would be like each time we'd revisit it we'd discover something new she was just really open and almost kind of a passivity in the best possible way where it's an acceptance of whatever's happening kind of allowing everything in allowing the audience to really be part of the performance and like the experiment on stage became what can we not play this time like we always have this kind of anchor in the song what if we just kind of try not playing that the idea is still there and 
see if that can somehow be detected. It got to be, there wasn't an attachment to any definitive version of the song. Like it would really keep developing even after the, maybe what could be considered the definitive cut on the record, but then we'd go and play the next shows and just, we were still taking a lot of risks with where it would go because she was always very optimistic in the face of anything really. <laughs> It's always about change, always. Transformation is about small things. And maybe we, it's not that we don't w like it or want it or it doesn't interest, maybe we overlook it or we just can't hear it. Yeah. It never, <laughs> never occurred to us that it was in this little thing. Yeah. I made a small, small song. And I think that's why it can be kind of unattractive to people in, in a certain way. Like, it's not as dramatic as catharsis is. Catharsis is very dramatic and colorful and it makes a big bang. This song is my small song. You can hear the same song in 10 years time and it has such a different effect on you. And if you hear the right thing at the right moment, Anything can happen. It's not like things add up and things are always the same. There's just an infinite number of possibilities. I think that's the thing that industry and marketing has no way of, of knowing, is that people's lives are full of meaningful coincidences and uh, it's, it's so infinitely personal and on such a small, infinitely small, tiny level. My song is so... So, so small. Mm -hmm. I could get down and go searching from wall to wall, and it ever see anything at all. How could you hate such a small? Could you hate such a small song? If I was right, I would be wrong. Don't be afraid, it's just a small. You're listening to And the Winner Is on CBC Radio 1 and on Sirius Satellite Radio. I'm Chris Howden. Today on the program, She Moves Between Worlds, a documentary about the late singer-songwriter Lassa de Sela. She Moves Between Worlds was written and produced by freelance broadcaster Madonna Hamel. of her public was all-encompassing. Uh, I mean, uh, when we were in Berlin that time, this girl walked in uh, after the show, uh, and she was a total punk German girl, and she had this huge tattoo of the cover of La Llorona. And it was exactly like the cover, the same colors, exactly everything. Like, whoa. And at the same time, you have a 70-year-old woman in Italy, and very light, Shallow people loved her work. Leonard Cohen loved her work. Patrick Watson, who is also a classical formation, loved her work. Watching Lassa sings like watching like a an old spirit sing, and without trying to be cheesy by saying that way, it's it's like a voice that comes from another place, you know. And then when you kind of hang around with Lassa, she has like a very very innocent sense of humor. Where do you go? She had those lyrics, I think, a long time ago, and and, uh, and I, when I saw the lyrics, I was like, oh, I got good music for you. 
So Patrick, some people had the idea that from her songs that she was melancholy, but you've seen many sides of Lassa. She wasn't like melancholic. She would always kind of hound me on the way I sing in terms of, I would, I would never pronunciate any words, I'd be mumbling and stuff like that, and she'd get very angry with me. <laughs> I always always get angry with her because she'd always tell the same stories between these songs before concerts. So we, <laughs> we kind of always kind of were pushing each other to, to kind of fix those kind of things about ourselves in, in, a, in a jokingly way. So it, it, for me, there are two very different things to me when, when she was singing in music and then when she was just kind of in person. Everybody that loved Lhasa, like, really loved Lhasa. And she, she said to me at one point that she tried when she was performing to imagine that she was providing a feeling of being the soulmate to everyone in the audience. That's how much she tried to give. And I don't know how anyone can do that. That sounds crazy. There's too many people in one place, right? <laughs> How can you be everything to all people at once? But then again, it's tricky because partly she really did give something that was so incredibly sincere and real and tangible, this really intense connection to maybe, maybe to our own dreams, to our own imagination. of who she was because of how well she could connect to people all people i think there was this weird double-edged sword thing going on where she often felt burdened by people that she didn't really know especially fans all of a sudden feeling like they had some kind of avenue or insight into her or who she was a tragic romantic long-suffering gypsy nomad diva right well, she was actually really happy, and more than anything else, she was just funny. She was just the funniest person I've ever met in my life. Well, you know, I never liked her jokes. Like, I would, maybe Sarah liked her jokes better than me. <laughs> she, in a way, she has a sense of humor, but I mean, she, has a, she had a very, from my view, I mean, she had kind of, kind of like a very kind of fun child, like kind of sense of humor, like a, she'd be like, where'd Napoleon put, her, put his armies? And she, she'd go up his sleeveys, and I'd be like, God. <laughs> okay, it's cool. It's a good joke. <laughs> possibility of compromise or of, um, of thinking in a merchant mentality about music is just 
completely impossible for me. And it always has been because it's not that I just don't think it's necessary. I, and I, I'm, I'm the living proof that it, is, <laughs> that it isn't necessary. I mean, you don't have to push yourself into a mold in order to, in order to be heard, you don't. And uh, so then life gets really exciting. When I did the second album, I was trying to do something so very, very personal and intimate. And, and then when it came out and it, it flew, you know? Yeah. And I, I thought, wow. Because I think it was, you know, with the three languages and maybe not doing what people would, really were expecting. I was a little bit nervous about it. Some other people around me were even more nervous than me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Travel this long, you just have to go on. Don't even look back to see how far you've come, though your body is bending under the law. There is nowhere to stop anywhere on this road. It's like I, I just barely am brave enough to do these things. But then when I realize that I do them and it's there's no problem. It, the road just get, opens up and it's like, why was I so, what was I afraid of? Even me, who was brought up the way that I was brought up, I still was afraid. People used to say, isn't singing in Spanish a problem? And it's, on the country, it was never a problem for me. And then singing in three languages, was that a problem? Never a problem. So never. A problem for who? Marketing. Marketing is like king. It's crazy. And not only that, I think people are, they more than get it. They're, People, that's what music is, mm -hmm. for God's sake. <laughs> it's like, oh my God, do we dare to do music? That's so risky. <laughs> I'll never get swallowed in darkness again. She thrived to be true to herself. Really, truly. I've never seen anything like that. We all say, we, want, we all know we should be true to ourselves. We all say, let's, you know, be true to yourself, be true to yourself. She was on that road very, very firmly. And she knew herself. And sometimes that made her very mean to others. But she did not compromise, or she very strongly tried to never compromise on that. And I think that was part of her becoming a whole, is not to cheat yourself. And it's not an easy fight, and you have uh, collateral damage and uh, casualties. But it's an honest and sincere and very, very deep, essential fight, actually, for some people. It also erases hypocrisy. You know, if you reach a point where you are absolutely true to yourself, then you cannot possibly be a hypocrite. And it's very beautiful to see somebody who is eradicating hypocrisy from his own self. Being able to do the music, it's like an alchem alchemical process, yeah. turning this base material into gold. And it's a scary thing to be a songwriter because I think even for the very disciplined and hardworking songwriters, I think there is um, a mysterious element to it. And so when the songs do come, it's kind of like their boss. <laughs> That's what when people say, ask me questions about why I made certain choices in the music, I just say, I just do what the songs tell me what to do. <laughs> I just say, yes, boss. <laughs> love fairy tales and old stories and I think the reason that I love them is because there is something really healing about them. Endlessly healing. Like you can just pretty much hear the same story over and over and over and over and over again and it never gets tiring. It never gets old because it's it's something that we need to hear. And I get discouraged with a lot of modern all forms of art because it's like they're they're neurotic. And I guess I can understand that, that we would be neurotic because of the way that we live, but we need, to, we need to get smarter than that, I think. We need to get out of that, that's enough. I think that 
Whereas maybe a couple hundred years ago, a lot of storytelling was about tall tales, mm. tales of accomplishment and heroic acts. I find that modern tales are about wounds yeah. and pain and suffering, and we're all very proud of our pain and suffering. And where we used to be proud of, of overcoming it, now we're just proud for living it. He was someone that believed, I don't know how to say this without it being kind of flaky, but he believed in like, you know, ma you know magic. <laughs> I don't know how to put it any other way than that, but like dream magic and the, the, those things that you can't explain that happen in all our lives, you know, like we call them deja vus or like you think about someone and somebody calls, all those like little details and all those kind of wonderful things about life. I think she brought people to a different place. She brought people back in time. I think she was like a time warp. She was able to kind of capture a different era for me before certain things were ruined. She was a great poet, an underestimated poet, I think. And uh, poets have a huge, obviously, aptitude to romanticize things. And um, so it's a great device to get over the tougher times and uh, she had that perfected and she when she lacked it in her life in her love life or in her daily life she felt less well I, I think this was one of the main 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 central f struggles of her life really to prove to to herself mostly that there is meaning in every day's life and that it doesn't have to be on a level of relentlessly spiritual. It can be in the act of brushing your teeth. I think that it is hard for kids to live with the kind of uprootedness and insecurity that we had when we were kids. So what we attached ourselves onto was the romance of it. And I think that definitely has served me well in my life. It's like I have this basic faith that my life is a story that, that is not a sad story.
I went to the, see uh, an exhibition on the Surrealists and there were all the collages by Max Ernst and I was just was possessed with this need. I ran out and bought all these old books and started doing my own collages too. So. That was really fun and I made myself laugh all the time or sometimes <laughs> I'd just be like trying different things and different people together and laughing by myself. I love that and I think that's what's really, what's really fun about collage, it's very freeing. Yeah. It's like a, there's this piece, it's called The Red-Haired Man, I don't know if you've ever heard of it, from Eastern Europe I think, who said there once was a red-haired man but actually he didn't really have red hair and actually he didn't have any hair and he didn't have any, he didn't even have a head or... <laughs> or arms or legs or a body or he didn't really have anything so maybe it would be better if we didn't say anything more about him <laughs> and I love that it's a joke about how easy it is to tell a story it's like you just say there once was a red-haired man and all of a sudden everybody believes it and they're ready for yeah. the next step and the collage is the same way it's like okay you put that there and then you put that there and it already tells the story it's so so easy I love that the animals are and the plants are bigger than the people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I liked that too. I liked it. It made it, it puts it in proper perspective. It's almost like she did look at the whole world as, as one big fairy tale. And there's just meaning in absolutely everything. Like her last album, she had conceived of doing it in, in a few different ways and tried a few different paths. And at one point, she was going to go to France and have it produced by a friend of hers there with a bunch of French musicians who she had kind of a funny feeling about. And as she was about to get in the cab to get on the plane to go make the album, she, she got in the cab and realized she'd forgot to say goodbye to her cat. And she ran back in the house and slipped on the ice and broke her leg. And it was like very severely, it was terrible. And she was just bedridden for months. And she really, really took it as a sign that she was not supposed to make the album in that way. did have this thing of people and animals being integrated. She loved that idea so much. Lonely spider I remember one of the first times that I went to her house, probably the first dinner that we, we had at her place together. We hadn't known each other that well yet. And she was sitting um, in a chair with the back like against this white wall. She was telling a story and I could see a spider kind of slowly walking down the wall towards her head. And I was starting to get more and more nervous about it, but she was really animated and I didn't want to interrupt her. And I was kind of starting to get concerned that the spider was going to either walk onto her head or that she would turn around and she would startle her or whatever it was and I, I, this went on for a few minutes because it was a long story and she finally at one point just turned and noticed it just as it was right next to her face and I thought like this was the moment where she was going to get a fright or something and she just went oh hello and she started to pick him up and she she said oh look a friend has come to visit and she she started to say right away that she really believed that insects were actually messengers to us and they all brought they all carried some kind of message you know <laughs> the shows we were going to continue doing. She really wanted us to be in costumes, but like have each have some kind of animal. Oh God, my favorite was, she told me this story of when she was a kid. I don't, I don't know why, this to me just epitomizes Lhasa. She said that when she was a kid. Sarah, there is a cat at your feet. Oh. He has just jumped up yep. onto your lap. Typical. <laughs> she said she always dreamed, like her biggest dream was to have antlers. 
She thought if she had antlers, that she would be so beautiful. And everybody would look at her and they would see her antlers and they would realize how beautiful she was. <laughs> yeah. I know they would really suit her. Carl Jung tells this story about somebody asking a rabbi why in the old days of the Bible people would always speak to God and, and see visions and dreams and stuff. And how come nobody does anymore? The rabbi says, because nobody would stoop so low. Is life like this? Who listens to their dreams? Who takes them seriously? People hundreds, thousands of years ago would have a dream and they'd say it's a vision, it's a message, you know? And now people just think, if, if they listen to them at all, they can think they're psychologically interesting, but not, you know, divinely inspired. <laughs> I had a dream about her, I think, the night before she passed away. I didn't really understand it until afterwards, but I was in a car and one of her songs was playing. I just remember, like, it, it was kind of one of those things right before you wake up. I just wanted to sit in the car until the song was finished. So then the song finished and I flipped off the car and woke up and I got the news, like, two days later. Dropped him in and he couldn't breathe. I, I, I've had people come up in the middle of the street. You know, I had one, one friend at one point stop and goes, I had a dream about Lassa last night, and she, in the dream she told me to tell you, everything's okay, I'm in heaven with Woody Allen, and everything's going okay. <laughs> I was like, okay, that's cool. Uh, and... Uh, her father had, a, had lent me a, a book called The Song Lines, which was one of Lassa's favorite books. I had refused to read the book up to there because I knew she was sick and I, I, it was very difficult to read, but that day I was like, oh, I felt like, okay, I'm opening the book. And uh, the day that I decided to open the book, or that, that morning, she passed on probably about the exact time that I decided to open the book. A dream about her. She was catching me up on what she's working on now and her new music and she's moving off in this whole other direction and she's really like in the dream it was that she's really pioneering something on her own. And I don't know what that's gonna be but yeah. Her absence through the presence <laughs> like because she was present and now she's absent it solidifies my understanding of life. It does. But, you know, I would, paraphrasing Jacques Brel, I said, if I was God today, I wouldn't be too proud of myself, you know, taking her at such a young age. The process was such a long and painful, painful, painful hell, where, she, you know, she would hallucinate. But even, uh, I'm not saying that for effect, uh, the hallucination that she went through were so funny the way she related them to us was so funny and that's something she didn't lose she giggled until there was no voice in her mouth she giggled she found ways to giggle and she would see a catwalk on the wall and we would giggle instead of you know getting scared maybe not all the time but we giggled so she giggled her way out 
<laughs> she they giggled, giggled their way, way out. out. Oh my god, yeah. Thank you. This is a story about my father, and he has a new idea. And his idea is that when we are conceived, we appear in our mother's womb like a little tiny light suspended in an immense space and there's no sound, it's completely dark and time doesn't seem to exist and then we're growing and we keep growing and growing and as we grow slowly we begin to feel things and touch things and touch the walls of our world then we begin to hear sounds and feel shocks that come to us from the outside. And as we get bigger and bigger, this world that we are inside, which seemed so huge in the beginning and so infinitely welcoming, has become very uncomfortable. And we are obliged to be born. And my father says that birth is so chaotic and violent that he's sure that at the moment of birth, we're all thinking, this is it, this is death, this is the end of my life. And then we're born, and in the beginning we're very small, and the world seems infinitely big, and time seems infinitely long, and we learn how to use our senses, and we learn how to touch one more time the, the contours of the world that we're in. And sometimes, mixed in with the sounds and sensations of this world, we hear sounds and feel shocks that come from yet another world. And that other world just follows us our whole lives long, as if something is happening just on the other side of a very, very thin wall. And then at the end of our lives, we're obliged to die. And then, we think we're really smart, and we think this time we know for sure that this is death and that this is the end. But that's the beginning of something else. So that's why I wrote this song. Soon this space will be too small. the 
I think a part of me had always thought that music was recorded in heaven, <laughs> like in some imaginary place, like they just caught the music in a That's nut right. and dragged it down to earth. <laughs> That was She Moves Between Worlds. It was written and produced by freelance broadcaster Madonna Amel. It originally aired on Inside the Music with Patti Schmidt in January of 2011, and a year later it was recognized with a Silver World Medal at the New York festivals. been listening to And the Winner Is on CBC Radio 1 and on Sirius Satellite Radio. If you have any comments about today's program, you can contact us through the website cbc.ca slash and the winner is. That's cbc.ca slash and the winner is. Just click on the contact us link. That site also includes all of our available podcasts, which are updated every Wednesday. This episode of And the Winner Is is produced by Sinisha Yolich. The CBC News is next. I'm Chris Howden. Thanks for listening.